Warning, this is a video about a set of horror games. While there are no jump scares in this video, some of these scenes can get a little graphic. With depictions including, but not limited to, drowning, dismemberment, and violent murder. The following video contains major spoilers for Until Dawn and Man of Medan, so if you want to experience either of these games blind, which I highly recommend, please turn back now. This video also assumes that you understand the plots of both games, so if you have no idea what Manchurian Gold is or can't tell me the weakness of a Wendigo, then you are going to be very confused. I've played Man of Medan about seven times. I've earned all the trophies, found all the collectibles, and seen just about every ending. I'm not going to beat around the bush. Man of Medan is a severely mediocre game. Unfortunately, it was marketed and designed as a spiritual successor to Until Dawn, at least until The Quarry was announced. And that was never something that Man of Medan could have aspired to be. I should make it clear that Until Dawn is one of those games that holds a special place in my heart. Playing through a game half a dozen times with your friends over the course of a few years will do that. So a hypothetical preferer of Man of Medan could call me out for bias. Of course I'm going to give Until Dawn an edge in a video where I compare it to its follow-up. However, I want to open this video with an olive branch to Man and Medan fans, as well as prove that I am being as objective as I am capable of being. I am going to attempt this by going over some aspects of Man and Medan that are actually better than Until Dawn. For starters, every character death in Man of Medan has a clear cause and effect that you can learn from on your own. Until Dawn has some fairly arbitrary deaths, the most extreme example being Matt. Matt did not survive my first playthrough. To be fair, neither did Chris or Ashley, but Matt was by far the most annoying. Here's how I killed him. I agreed with Emily's plan to find help because I didn't have the energy to argue with her. I gave Matt the flare gun which he immediately fired into the air for some reason. When the tower fell I tried to help Emily because that was the right thing to do and as a result Matt was dragged away by a wendigo and impaled on a meat hook. You see what I mean when I say these games can get a little graphic? See, if you want Matt to survive, you either need to initially disagree with Emily's plan, meaning Matt won't fire the flare gun for some reason, and use it to shoot the Wendigo. Or, you need to abandon Emily to save yourself and avoid the Wendigo altogether. This choice is so arbitrary that I needed a guide to figure out where I was going wrong. There was nothing in-game that suggested that disagreeing with Emily's plan or leaving her to die was a good idea if you wanted to keep Matt alive. By contrast, all the deaths in Man of Medan have a clear cause that you can decipher and learn from. Did Fliss drown in the chamber? Should have gone for the hinges. Brad shows up dead with a stab wound? Maybe don't stab that cultist next time. Got Conrad shot like I did in my first playthrough? Don't screw up the quick time event, idiot! You won't always know where you went wrong immediately, but by the time you're ready for your second playthrough, you should know what you need to do differently. The second thing that Man of Medan does better is that every character gets equal billing and is fair game for getting killed. Because Matt and Jessica can die early on in Until Dawn, if you save them, you don't see them again until near the end of the story. In fact, one of the endings that my friends and I always speculate on is one in which Matt or Jessica is the sole survivor. Until Dawn also makes sure that Mike and Sam survive until the climax of the story. Anyone else is fair game, but Until Dawn cannot conclude without these two characters, so even if you make all the wrong decisions, the worst you'll get is missing out on some clues, and the blood of a dog will be on your hands, you monster. Man of Medan does not have this issue. Unless Conrad escapes at the beginning, every character has just about as much screen time. The only bottleneck I noticed is that you will always have at least three characters alive when you get to the radio room, but which three characters they will be is completely up to your actions. Before this point, Conrad can get shot, fall or jump to his death, Brad can get stabbed, drown or fall to his death, 
Fliss can get her skull cracked open, drown or fall to her death, and either Alex or Julia can be killed by Olsen following their chase, but only if you have enough survivors that neither of their deaths will get you below three characters. While some of these guys have more opportunities to die than others, no one has total plot armour. Lastly, because Man of Medan is set up to be played multiplayer, characters in a scene who are not controlled by the player will usually have a range of choices they can pick from. This means that two playthroughs where you make the same decisions can still be slightly different. Unlike Until Dawn, where only the player's choices are variable. These are some of the things that Man of Medan does better, and they're not small or superficial improvements by any means. However, it is still an inferior game to Until Dawn in most other regards. Wait, how can I be confident that comparing Man of Medan to Until Dawn is fair in the first place? Is it fair to pit them against each other just because they're both interactive narrative choices matter horror games? Well, yes, on the very basis that they're two games occupying the same market. And if you're going to name drop Until Dawn in your trailer over a cover of Oh Death, the audience is allowed to expect a follow up to Until Dawn and be disappointed when that expectation is not met. But most importantly, many elements from Until Dawn were superficially included in Man of Medan, seemingly for no greater purpose than brand cohesion. The first element that doesn't measure up, but also the most excusable, is the curator. Until Dawn has the players directly interact with Dr. Hill, an intense therapist who seems a bit cryptic and weird. Dr. Hill comes up periodically to psychoanalyze the player in some not so subtle ways and add some intrigue to the early plot. We learn as the story goes on that the Dr. Hill we are interacting with is actually a figment of Josh's schizophrenia. And in a detail that someone should win an award for, if you find Josh's phone, you discover that Dr. Hill is a real person in the canon of the narrative, but is far nicer than Josh imagines him. In Man of Medan, we have the curator. The curator is portrayed as the one telling the story and letting the player interject with their own decisions. We only get a few visits from the curator. He isn't involved in the plot in any way, nor does the player's interactions with him change anything about the story. As a result, the curator isn't nearly as intriguing or mysterious as Dr. Hill. He's just kind of there. Now, I say that this disparity in quality has a reasonable excuse because Dr. Hill was a character meant to play a very specific role in a single story, whereas the curator is something of a mascot for the Dark Pictures Anthology series and will supposedly show up in future games fulfilling a similar role. He even name drops the sequel during the credits. Who knows, maybe there is a grand plan for the curator further down the Dark Pictures anthology line, but for the time being his presence feels a little tacked on. There are two other aspects of Until Dawn that Man of Medan superficially included, but these aspects are executed inexcusably worse and frankly should have been left out altogether. These aspects are the post-game scenes and the premonitions. When you finished Until Dawn, you got these police interrogation videos with your surviving characters. They talked about what happened, asked about other characters, and generally gave us an idea of how they were processing the events of the game. If you need someone to talk to... I'm fine. Sometimes, after a traumatic experience... I said I'm fine. Nana Medan does something similar. Once the game is over, the surviving characters discuss the events of the game, but everything about the implementation makes these scenes inferior. For starters, there's no context. It was clear that the Until Dawn crew were being interrogated. They were asked questions, they had to defend each other against the narrative the police were trying to create. You, you, you don't understand, don't you understand? If he attacked you, he saved my life. It was a conversation that fits into the canon of the story. The Man of Medan crew mostly just talk into the void. It's basically a fourth wall break for the characters to tell us, the players, what they're thinking and feeling. Perhaps I could have overlooked this issue had the characters actually said anything of substance, but we couldn't even get that. There isn't a single line I can find in these post-game scenes that make them worthwhile. Every time Brad survives, he has a line about knowing what he saw, but not believing in what he saw. You know, I just keep going over it, 
and over it. And it doesn't make any sense. Just, and I know what I saw. I just don't believe in whatever it was that I saw. This line appears no matter what he sees or doesn't see. It's a line vague enough to apply to anything, but once you've heard it five or so times in extremely different circumstances, you realise that it means nothing. Given the lack of good detail and even the haphazard way that they're stitched together in real time, I would not be the least bit surprised to hear that this was one of the final additions to the game. Quickly slapped on because Until Dawn had it. Speaking of which, Until Dawn also had a totem collectible that would show you possible futures for your playthrough. These premonitions were split up into five categories. Death, Danger, Loss, Guidance, and Fortune. Each category showed you a different kind of event, and while they could be difficult to decipher for a first time player, those paying attention could certainly get some useful hints out of these premonitions. The best example I can think of is this guidance totem that sees Chris putting a gun down. If you get that premonition and you pay attention to it, you know exactly what to do when he and Ashley are trapped in the jigsaw like contraption. Man of Medan implements premonitions through paintings you can find throughout the game. These premonitions are useless. The categories of white and black frame pictures are vague enough, but the premonitions themselves offer nothing. Take this premonition called Copper Bottomed. It shows a helicopter landing on the ghost ship. Once you get to the radio room, you contact the military. It's at this point you'll realise that this must be what summons the helicopter. But based on the premonition, is telling them where you are a good decision or a bad one? Well, this premonition fails to foreshadow that it depends on whether you give them the name of the boat or not. There are also premonitions that mean absolutely nothing to the player until they have finished the game. Take Devil in the Deep, where Julia looks like she might be hyperventilating or scared. As someone who has completed the game multiple times, I know that this is her dying of decompression sickness. But how could you have possibly guessed that unless you already knew? The premonitions feel just like the post-game scenes, in that they feel like an afterthought, tacked on at the last minute because you can't make an interactive horror game without premonitions. Why do I keep these around? Of course, these are only minor issues. If this were the extent of my complaints for Man of Medan, this video probably wouldn't exist. My real issues with this game are far more foundational. My primary criticisms come down to these points. The story is static, the monster is a letdown, and the climax is severely underwhelming, especially when you realise what it could have been. Let's start with that first point. The threat in Until Dawn does not stay the same the whole way through. A lot of strange things happen throughout the early story. Supernatural activity, weird noises outside, and evidence that some kind of maniac is hiding out on the mountain. The pin drops when Jessica is abducted and Josh is sliced in half by a jigsaw style machine. The next few chapters are all about trying to reunite your friends and avoiding this maniac. You do eventually find out that Josh had faked his own death and was the maniac the entire time. But as he gives his villain monologue, you realise that it doesn't explain everything. This is explicitly brought to our attention when Josh has no idea what happened to Jessica, and Emily has to escape from some kind of monster that Josh is too tied up to be involved with. At this point, Until Dawn seamlessly and naturally transitions from a story about a serial killer to a story about monsters. This is why having Jessica or Matt as sole survivors is so interesting. Jessica checks out of the story before anyone figures out there's a maniac toying with them and as such is completely clueless. I was carried and um, taken and... Matt does learn about the maniac, but he checks out of the story before the reveal that it was Josh or that there are monsters on the mountain. If he is the sole survivor, he will blame the events of the game on the maniac. There was, there, there, there was a madman and he was after us. He, 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 he killed Josh and he was trying to kill all of us. The story hints at just enough of the monster plot that it doesn't come out of left field, but not so much that it becomes obvious that there's more going on. It's brilliant. Man of Medan has no such turning point. 
While their short-term goals do change throughout the story, the threat remains more or less the same, only variating in that Olsen will become more unhinged as the narrative goes on. Now, one might argue that Man and Medan didn't have time for an Until Dawn style shift in the narrative, as it is only half as long. But they could have easily had one. Just as the Maniac was the initial threat in Until Dawn, the pirates could have acted as the initial threat in Man and Medan before the real threat showed up. Imagine finding Olsen, the man who held your party hostage and possibly killed Conrad, completely mangled or torn apart in the game's midpoint, and being introduced to the real antagonist from there. But that leads to our second problem, Man of Medan's monster. I make no hyperbole when I say that Until Dawn's Wendigos are just as iconic and terrifying as Doctor Who's Weeping Angels. They're hyper deadly, damn near indestructible, and best of all, they have a weakness that sounds easy to exploit in theory, but you know would be damn near impossible in a high stress situation. The more clues you uncover, the more you learn about these creatures, where they come from and how they work. They act consistently and present the same rules for everyone. Don't move and they won't see you. So how did Supermassive Games follow up their story with a monster that genuinely makes my skin crawl? They didn't even bother. Yeah, the twist behind Man and Medan's monster is that there is none. The entire ship is seeping with a chemical weapon called Manchurian Gold that causes hallucinations. Now, usually it was all a hallucination would be considered a cop-out ending, but I would argue that the game does enough interesting stuff with these hallucinations mechanically to make them worthwhile. You see, the hallucinations usually cover up other characters. When Conrad is running from the Glamour Girl, that's Fliss. When Julia sees Alex drowning himself, one of those is Danny, who looks like a zombie when you play as Alex. Fliss is confronted by a cultist priest, that's just Brad. Most, if not all of the hallucinations can create deadly situations. Remember when I said that Fliss can get her head cracked open? That's Brad hallucinating that she is some kind of zombie. Narratively though, Manchurian Gold leaves a lot to be desired. Ideally, having every character hallucinate something different would offer a deeper look into their psyche. Imagine if the Manchurian Gold showed these characters something that related to their past or their worst fears, as it did in the comic strip you unlock for finding all the clues. But we don't get that. Alex and Brad are so blank as characters that they just hallucinate zombies. You could take the cultist that Fliss sees to deduce that she is superstitious, but we learnt that before we even got to the ghost ship. You think you can scavenge down there and it makes no difference, but every single thing you bring back has an essence. It's like a ghost you invite to the surface. You could take Julia seeing Alex's face everywhere as evidence that she has mixed feelings about him, but most people will figure that out simply by the dialogue choices available on the dive. Conrad is a little more interesting in that his hallucination is a glamour girl who turns monstrous, but what can you really tell me about Conrad based on this hallucination that I don't already know from his first five minutes of screen time? Selling, I'm the way Manchurian Gold was handled as a mystery also leaves much to be desired. You see, once you know that the monsters aren't real, you know what the best choice is in most situations. So it's a shame that most people will figure out there's hallucinogenic gas before we even meet the main characters. Now, I had the gas thing spoiled for me before I even played, so if your experience was different, please let me know in the comments. But the early shot of the leaking crates, the green gas, and all the strange things happening around the ship kind of made it obvious. Once the main characters make it to the ghost ship, the hints become far more obvious. The character you play will see things that no one else acknowledges, and other characters will jump at things that you, as a player, don't see. And just in case it's still unclear, there's a cutscene towards the end where the main characters figure out that all the strangeness results from hallucinogenic gas. Okay, so follow my thinking here. We know this ship is carrying the Manchurian gold but that was really some sort of hallucinogenic bioweapon developed in China during World War II. And 
we know that it was super unstable and leaked all over the ship. So maybe it's still here? Whether it's Brad or Alex that goes down the hole, whether you've found clues or not, they will always figure out and explain explicitly that nothing strange they see is real. This doesn't even cause a turning point in the narrative, because one, you've likely figured it out already, and two, while you can deal with more hallucinations, they're not that much different to the ones you've dealt with already. Yes, when it comes to Until Dawn, you could have figured out that there was more going on than the murderer on the mountain. But show me someone who guessed Wendigos on their first playthrough, and I will show you a liar. Why is it such a big deal that you know there's hallucinogenic gas on the ship? Because it takes what could be difficult choices and makes them obvious. You know that if there's a monster in front of you, the correct decision is to not hurt it. If running from a monster becomes too risky, you know to stop running. While it's true that Until Dawn has this issue to a minor extent, a lot of the choices in that game come down to risking yourself to save others, and it isn't always clear if doing so is a good move. The Quarry actually does this better than both Until Dawn and Man of Medan, but we're not here to talk about the Quarry. Not yet, anyway. So, Man of Medan's story is a tad underwhelming, but surely it has a banger ending. Well, it nearly did. Before we unpack that statement, do I even need to tell you that Until Dawn's climax is phenomenal? It's tense and exciting. Chris could barely handle one Wendigo a few hours ago, and now the lodge is full of them. Make every right decision and you can get everyone out alive, but slip up just once, and you could ruin your run right at the very end. I cannot think of a single thing I would have done to make Until Dawn's ending better. It is just that good. Man of Medan has two climaxes. Which one you'll get in your playthrough depends on whether or not Alex goes down the hole in the radio room. If Alex doesn't go down the hole, he eventually bumps into Olsen, who he chases to get back the distributor cap. After a comically brief chase, Olsen just kind of succumbs to the Manchurian gold and has a heart attack. From there, Alex grabs the distributor cap and keeps his cool as he hallucinates one last time before the story ends. The climax you get if Alex does go down the hole is a little more thrilling. You get into a scuffle with Olsen and need to drop a heavy door on him. If you fail the last quick time event, generally considered one of the hardest in the game, the character who was fighting Olsen will also be killed. You'll notice that one climax focuses more on dealing with the hallucinations and the other is more about dealing with Olsen. This is actually kind of cool. Josh didn't return for the climax of Until Dawn, so seeing Man and Medan have two different endings based on its two primary threats is an interesting creative choice. However, what if I told you that there was very nearly an ending that gave us both? Man of Medan was going to have a third climax that took place in the same area as the Fighting Olsen ending, just a level higher. Water rises in the room and connects to some live wires, making it lethal. And because the Manchurian gold is close by, whoever you're playing as sees Olsen as something different. Alex sees zombie Olsen, Emily sees the second Alex. Alex! No, Alex! They can't be both real! Conrad sees the glamour girl, and so on. You gotta choose the right dialogue options, just like you did with Junior, and if you make any poor decisions, you could lose a character right here at the end. Finally, this climax would destroy the entire ship, meaning if you didn't get the distributor cap, you were screwed. No Conrad with the Coast Guard or non-hostile military options. You either get the Duke of Milan running, or you go down with the ship. If finished and included in the game, this would have been the superior climax to the story. It would have combined the best elements of both pre-existing endings, it would have been tense just like Until Dawn's ending, and best of all, it would have been genuinely climactic. But for whatever reason, this ending was never finished. Now, don't get me wrong, if I had to choose between the scrapped climax and the two we got, I would have picked the two, as leaving the ship intact is necessary for many of the game's endings. But it is a shame that neither climax could replicate the feeling of the cut one, as it means that Man of Medan ends the way it played all the way through. Just kind of meh.
Let me be clear, Man of Medan is not a bad game. Being the spiritual successor to Until Dawn just gave it some big shoes to fill. It didn't come close, granted, but it made some specific strides in specific areas. As much as the developers probably don't want to think like this, I can't help but see the Dark Pictures anthology as their playground. A space where they can experiment with snacky experiences to see what sticks. And this experimentation is important for two reasons. First of all, seeing the ways that Man of Medan fails makes me appreciate Until Dawn all the more. Noticing that the curator is a non-presence throughout the game makes me appreciate the work that must have gone into entwining Dr. Hill into Until Dawn's narrative. Being stuck in a stagnant story put into perspective how masterful Until Dawn's pacing is. And playing through a story with a fake monster cemented my belief that having a real monster like a Wendigo was the best decision that Supermassive could have made. The second benefit to this kind of experimentation is that you're bound to learn a few things for future games. You could, theoretically, take the best parts of Man of Medan, put them into Until Dawn, and make a better game. And they did. When I first played Man of Medan, I wondered if Until Dawn was lightning in a bottle. If the stars had just aligned for supermassive games on this one, and we were never going to see anything quite like it again. I'm glad to say that the answer to all of this is no. The Quarry is a truly worthy successor to Until Dawn, improving on many of its issues and barely ever falling short in other areas. And some of those improvements could first be seen in Man of Medan. I can't wait to tell you all about the quarry. But first, I need to take a little trip to Little Hope. That's all for this video. I'd like to thank my patrons. Orion Tran, Lars Espen, Data52, Jamman5, Pixcalibur, Alberto Cruz, Tyler Bennett, Tenka, Jeremy Pashik, Fireclaw, Christopher Wang, Will, Mario, Luke Stewart, Ignatio, Swiss Cage, Stage 4 Boss, Gerald, and John. Thank you all very much for watching, and I will see you next time.